Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum. I'm very happy to see all the faces again. May Allah bless you all. It is narrated that Imam Ali alayhi salam in one of his beautiful du'as he says, Ilahi anta kama uhib fajalni kama tuhib. My Lord, you are like I love. Make me like you love. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. Thank you. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد. رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي. أما بعد يقول الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. وقال رجل مؤمن من آل فرعون يكتم إيمانه. أتقتلون رجلا أن يقول ربي الله وقد جاءكم بالبينات من ربكم. صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد So inshallah I'll be talking about taqiyya in this talk The roots of taqiyya, how it is justified in sharia Some misconceptions about taqiyya Explaining it first of course um, Talk a bit about some historical development uh, Especially in the Shia history And if we have time inshallah I'll talk also about um, some maybe objections but before that, let me uh, take a few minutes to extend our condolences to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, to the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa sallam, to our Imam, to everyone here, to every lover of truth on, and freedom in the world uh, on the occasion of the martyrdom anniversary of Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. Imam Sajjad, our fourth Imam, who was endowed with the great responsibilities immediately after the events of Karbala, in the year 61 Lil Hijrah. Imam Sajjad was responsible of clarifying what happened, clarifying the truth, facing the propaganda of the Umayyad government, clarifying that those who were killed were not the enemy, they were not disbelievers, they were not rebels, they were actually the family of the Prophet Imam Sajjad had also the mission of rebuilding or recreating a new elite of Shia of Ahlul Bayt because all those first class elite were either killed in Karbala or imprisoned in the Umayyad prisons or lost in the desert. So Imam Sajjad السلام, in 30 plus years, this is what he focused on doing. Imam Sajjad had also the responsibility of spreading the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt السلام, despite the difficult circumstances that surrounded his life. And inshallah, I'll touch upon it very briefly in my talk too. So let's start on taqiyya. Now, linguistically, when we say in Arabic, waqar rajulu shay'an, huh? it means that someone took a shield from something to protect him from something. Yeah? You remember the term taqwa, very same root. Huh? Waqa, taqwa, taqiyya. So this is where, for example, we see in one of the verses, Allah says, فَوَقَاهُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِ مَا مَكَرُ And Allah, so Allah protected him from the evil of their schemes. Right? So there is evil, there is protection and shielding. This is wiqaya. Or in the khutbah of the Holy Prophet وسلم, welcoming the month of Ramadan. What does he say? اِتَّقُ النَّارَ وَلَوْ بِشِقِّ تَمْرَ huh? Shield yourselves from the fire, even if you have to offer a tiny piece of date. For people to do iftar. Yeah, ittaqunna. So shield yourself from nar. Now, the technical meaning of taqiyya is what? It's basically when you conceal your thoughts, when you conceal your ideas, your beliefs, when you even sometimes say things or do things that are not in line with your beliefs, when you are a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet and the Message. Yes? That's a very important condition when you are a believer. Because this way, with this definition, you take out what? Nifaq. Hypocrisy, because hypocrisy is quite the opposite of this, isn't it? When you conceal enmity towards, let's say, the message, you don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Prophet, but you show that you do for interests. Huh? So that's nifaq. Taqiyya, no. You do not compromise your beliefs. Your beliefs are never compromised. Yes? But because of certain circumstances, you will have to say something, do something, or maybe conceal your thoughts because of some pressures, because of some harm, because of... There is a threat somewhere, and that's important too. There has to be a certain exceptional circumstance that there is a hardship. There is a threat. There is a uh, possibility of harm, huh? unbearable harm. 
as we'll mention, inshallah. For example, if you live in a place where you being a Muslim is a crime, so what would you do? You would conceal your faith, maybe. And this is the verse that I recited in the beginning about that man from the family of Pharaoh. So chapter 40, verse 28, this man from the family of Pharaoh concealed his faith and he came to talk and defend uh, the prophet. So this is an example. Another example, sometimes actually you might have to swear by God that you're not Muslim, for example. Huh? If there's a threat of death or a threat of severe hardship. So this is something that you do, you say, that is not in line with your belief. So this, these are some examples of, of taqiyya. Now, of course, there is a misconception somewhere. Like now, if you go and surf the internet, you will likely come across some pages, some videos that would tell you what? Taqiyya is a Shi'i thing. It's a Shi'a thing. You know, they live by taqiyya. It's something that is like main fundamental belief in their belief system, which is not true. And therefore, the Shia are, for example, liars. So you would find this kind of popular, um, mainstream, sometimes non-Shia understanding of taqiyya or uh, perception of taqiyya. And that's problematic, to be honest, because then whatever you say, you will not be taken seriously. Like now, if anyone is listening who thinks that Shia do taqiyya everywhere, every time, <laughs> I can't do much, to be honest, to convince them, because everything I'd be saying, they would be thinking that it's just saying it. Yeah, it's not serious. Habibi, wallah, our Qur'an is the Qur'an that was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the Qur'an that you find in Mecca, you find in all the mosques of the Muslims, all the houses of... No, no, no. You're saying this just because you are Shia and you are doing taqiyya. No? So what can you do then? You just give up, to be honest. So the reasons for this kind of misconception is possibly, possibly a confusion of the Shia or the followers of Ahlul Bayt with maybe some groups who are... Um, who have some bataniya kind of beliefs, who hold that, for example, the truth should not be revealed, the truth should be concealed, um, no one is able to, not everyone is able to bear the truth, so it should be concealed in all circumstances. So some people might have confused the Shia with these kind of groups. Or it could be the result of an incorrect or unreasonable reading of history, because those do not know that also in Sunni history there was times where people had to do taqiyya too. We remember, for example, at the time of uh, the Khalifa uh, al-Ma'mun, the time of the Khalifa al-Ma'mun, who appointed Imam Rada as the crown prince, isn't it? He basically launched an inquisition uh, campaign. Why? If you believe that the Quran was eternal and is not created, then you are mushrik. And all the scholars had to comply with this tenant of faith. And we see most of the scholars, they would actually say yes. Fine, they would do this taqiyya basically. Except a few, maybe Ahmed bin Hanbal was one of them actually. Huh? But all of the scholars, or most of the scholars, they complied. Now Ibn Kathir actually explains, he says, well, these scholars had to do this, had to do this. And he called it musana'a. Because, you know, they had interests, they had some um, wealth, some rights from the treasury, they had, their, they had their jobs, they had their positions. So they had to secure all these. And it's fine what they did. Right? But he calls it musana. Yeah? Basically, it's taqiyya. It's what we call taqiyya. It's the same thing. Maybe taqiyya is actually more serious because it can get you know, kind of more serious in, towards life threat. Huh? So taqiyya is indeed in line with Islam. It's not lying or it's not you know, outside the line of Islam. Why? I'll mention it, inshallah. I'll mention the evidence. So what allows one to do taqiyya? It is allowed under... So there's two titles. One is the main one, which is the title of compulsion. Yeah, necessity, because of hardship. Huh? For example, this is what's called ittirar, ittura or ittirar. Ittirar is what? Is when you're in a situation where there is a life risk on you or that there is an unbearable hardship. That's what they call ittirar. Yeah, something, some hardship that you cannot be, you know, you cannot bear it. So basically what you do with taqiyya is that you would avoid that unbearable hardship in the interim by saying words, by concealing your faith, by you know, doing some things, so that you avoid that hardship. Huh? So that you avoid that uh, um, uh, hardship. Because the opposite person, basically what they're doing is what? They're oppressing you. Huh? They're harassing you. They are attacking you. They're threatening you. They're persecuting you. So this is a natural response. 
from you know humans, from us as humans. So in the hadith, in the Sunni sources, the hadith is attributed to the Prophet وسلم, in this kind of expression, Rufi'a or Rafa Allah min ummati al khata wa nisyan wa mastukrihu alayh. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has lifted the pen, as in we are not held accountable, the ummah is not held accountable if they do khata, honest mistake. If you do an honest mistake, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardons you, obviously. Forgetfulness, you're pardoned when you forget. And what they have been kind of forced or compelled to do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not uh, you know, hold us accountable in these situations. And Suyuti, you know, he, his opinion is that this is one of the uh, popular or mashhur hadith. Ibn al-Arabi al-Maliki also, they, he suggests that the scholars agree uh, about the meaning of the hadith at least. In the Shia sources, you would see this, for example, in Kitab al-Tawheed for Saduq by Saduq, um, attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it mentions nine things, not just three things. From these nine things, it says, رُفِعَ عَنْ أُمَّتِي تِسْعَةً الْخَطَأْ وَالنِّسْيَانَ وَمَا أُكْرِهُ عَلَيْهُ وَمَا لَا يَطِيقُونَ وَمَا لَا يَعْلَمُونَ وَمَا اضْطُرُوا إِلَيْهُ huh? Similar content, basically, plus a few things. So that's one title, yeah? Hardship. Hardship. اضطرار. The other title, usually, you hear it from scholars, which is called something like the greater interest of the Muslim community. Huh? Sometimes you have in fiqh some particular conditions or particular rulings that we say, look, it is okay, we could sacrifice these for the interest of or for the larger interest of the Muslim community. For example, in the Shi'i fiqh, um, in the Imami fiqh, the leader of the jama'ah has to be what? Adil, has to be Imami, Ithna Ashari, yes? But if there is a jama'ah that is there with the Muslims, it is okay that you sacrifice these conditions and if the leader is not imami, say, it's okay, you go and pray because this is better for the outlook or for the spirit of the Muslim ummah as a unity. This is where Imam Sadiq, we see traces of this from Imam Sadiq when, السلام, when he recommends or he commands his companions to go and pray with the Muslims. He says, go and pray with them even if you disagree with them in your madhab or in your, you know, some thoughts. Go and pray with them. So why does one then go to taqiyya by compulsion? Generally, this happens in situations where there is no freedom of expression, where there is no opportunity for dialogue, there's no bridges of dialogue, there's no intellectual discussion. Huh? No, basically it's my way or the highway. It's persecution, right? The highway would be persecution, would be what? Brutal kind of um, suppression sometimes, brutal killing, as we've seen in history. So this is what taqiyya is all about, basically. That, you have an idea, Right, lofty idea, you keep it, you conceal it, you reveal something that might be opposite to it in the interim as an exception so that you are actually in line or you're living the reality so that you're not far from the reality. In the Quran, let's go to the Quran, yes? There is generally three verses that are mentioned when we talk about taqiyya. The first verse is the one that I started my talk with about that man from the family of Pharaoh who concealed his faith. So that's an example of concealing faith. Quran chapter 16 verse 106 It says A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim man kafara billahi min ba'di imanih illa man ukriha wa qalbuhu mutma'innun bil iman huh? An English translation Whoever disbelieves in Allah i.e. denies Allah after his belief except for the one who is forced to renounce his religion while his heart is secure in faith So see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is about to rebuke some people but immediately he says well there's an exception there is some people who are compelled, but in their hearts, faith is still cemented, is still fixed there. Huh? That's, that's an important condition there. And if we go to the historical accounts about this particular verse, we learn about who? The companion Ammar bin Yasir. At the early times of the da'wah to Islam, Ammar bin Yasir was captured, his mother, his father, Yasir and Sumayya were captured, were tortured, were forced to renounce the Prophet, renounce the message. And Ammar and, sorry, Sumayya and Yasir were killed. And Ammar, under that pressure, he uttered words of disbelief. When he met the Prophet, the Prophet ﷺ told him, Ammar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed your excuse. In adu fa'ud. Ya Ammar, in adu fa'ud. Faqad anzal Allah azza wa jalla udrak wa amaraka an ta'ud in adu. Ammar, God excuses you, don't worry. 
if they do it again, you do it again. Huh? So this kind of gives a permission. And permission is not a privilege to the person of Ammar. It's because of the situation, the circumstance. That forced Ammar to utter these words. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also excuses uh, the servant. Now Imam Sadiq in a narration in Kafi, I'll skip it now. He actually extracts a general jurisprudential ruling or principle. That between death and saying what you don't believe in, huh, you are allowed to choose. Yeah, so this is what taqiyya actually allows you. The second ayah is uh, Quran chapter 3 verse 28. لا يتخذ المؤمنون الكافرين أولياء من دون المؤمنين ومن يفعل ذلك فليس من الله في شيء إلا أن تتقوا منهم تقات English. The believers may not take the unbelievers for their allies in preference to those who believe. Not allowed. Whoever does this has nothing to do with Allah. Unless, ah, exception again. Unless he does so in order to protect himself from them. So again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, look, there is a situation, exceptional circumstance, huh, that allows one to do this. So which basically, this verse is licensing, showing wilaya or showing, let's say, agreement to the kafirin huh, at the superficial level without, of course, merging or without um, aligning your beliefs with theirs. So remember, your heart has to still keep connection with the faith. Otherwise, it becomes nifaq. And the Quran actually talks about this. Chapter 4, verse 140. بَشَّرِ الْمُنَافِقِينَ بِأَنَّ لَهُمْ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا And 141. So give good news of painful punishment to the hypocrites who choose disbelievers as allies instead of the believers. Do they seek honor and power through that company? Surely all honor and power belongs to Allah. So once you actually show disbelief, and in your heart, Start thinking that, okay, I'm actually now in coherence with their beliefs, genuinely, internally, then you're a munafiq. If you seek some interest that you might want to gain, then you're a munafiq. Huh? The Quran very clearly says it. So, taqiyya therefore gives you an option. When it is about your personal cir circle or circumstance, you have the option. You could either choose death, and that was the situation of whom the mother and father of Ammar. So Sumayya and Yasir, they actually died. They were killed. So they chose death. Ammar chose to survive. Huh? So this is, it actually allows you to choose between the two things. And you know, with this permission, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala respects, wants to respect two things. First is your desire for life. Your desire for life. With dignity. So Ammar bin Yasser, when he did this, his dignity is preserved. Not that he will live in shame, I did this or I said that. No, no, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserves your dignity when you choose your desire for life. Or the other option, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also respects when you choose what? That you want to manifest your deep faith by choosing martyrdom, for example. Huh? Imam al-Baqir was asked once about this. He was asked. He has said, he was told... عن عبد الله بن عطاء سوين كافي قلت لأبي جعفر الباقر رجلان من أهل الكوفة so two people from Kufa they were taken captured by the army of Muawiyah by Muawiyah and they were demanded to denounce Ali and curse Ali bin Abi Talib so the person is telling Imam Baqir he said one did curse and he was released the other person refused and he was killed what do you think Imam Baqir said that one who renounced Ali, he's knowledgeable about his deen. He knows his excuses. He knows the rules. He knows that Allah pardons him. As for the person who did not denounce Ali, he hastened to Jannah. Huh? So, this is when it is related to your own personal circle. So you have the permission. But when exposing the truth harms someone else or a group of people. Huh? If now some people come to me and tell me, look, do you know the house of Iqbal uncle? Huh? And I know they, they will harm him. Yeah, it's a threat. Yeah, of course I say, no, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know his house, right? Otherwise, that would be a problem, isn't it? 
So this it becomes wajib to do taqiyya actually because you want to preserve the interest of a person, the life of a person. And sometimes the interest of a group, the interest or the life or the health of say the leader of this group. And this is what we witness in the history of the Shias actually throughout the early Muslim history, right? So let me actually touch upon that point so that we appreciate what this means. I'll go a bit on a kind of a historical narrative of how taqiyya might have developed. So let me start from the time of Imam Ali alayhi salam, right, to the time of Imam al-Rudha. So that's around 150 years, 200 years, right? So we notice at the time of Imam Ali alayhi salam and the time of, Imam, say, Lady Fatima, Imam al-Hassan, Imam al Hussein, we see at this early stage that there was an exclusion of the school of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. There was an exclusion. Yes, there, is some, there was some exceptions that, you know, Imam Ali would be asked for a consultation, for example. He would give some advice. Yes, these happened, but not in the sense that Imam Ali had a certain, you know, circle or school in the mosque where he would be spreading his knowledge. That wasn't the case. Huh? So there was a kind of an exclusion. Imam Ali, Lady Fatima, Imam Al Hassan with Muawiyah too. So there wasn't an establishment of the Ahlul Bayt school. There wasn't any spread of the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt properly. The time of Imam Hussein, we know what happened with Imam Hussein alayhi salam, yeah? And what happened with Imam Hussein is that, you know, the bloodshed of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and his companions and his family, what it did is that it laid the foundations for later establishing the school of Ahlul Bayt, the pillars defining the features by the later Imams. What do I mean? You know, sometimes you have a group who are in the shadow, Huh? In the shadow. Something happens, some big tragedy happens, and then it floats to the public. Then it floats to the spotlight. Right? This is what the revolution of Imam al Hussein did. And it inspired many revolutions later. Huh? It inspired many revolutions during the Umawi time, during the Abbasi time, even, even the revolution of Fakh as well, 100 years later. So, this is what the blood of Imam al Hussein salam, did. Now, after that, with Imam Sajjad, with Imam al-Sajjad, now as I mentioned in the introduction, Imam now had a responsibility, has a responsibility to clarify this message. But of course, the circumstances were very difficult, were very, very difficult with the Umayyad kind of surveillance over him. And therefore, he did that covertly, covertly, with some tactics. He didn't have, you know, schools like we would hear about Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam later. No, no. He would do it, you know, quietly. He would embed the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt salam, through du'as that he would recite, which reached us today as a Sahifa Sajjadiyah, for example. Huh? He would teach slaves. Huh? Some people in his house, he would teach them. And then when they graduate, he would send them to the corners of the earth. Very smart. And after Imam Sajjad salam, now we see at the time of Imam Baqir and Imam Sadiq, because there was a decline in the Umayyad government and there was a slow rise in the Abbasi government, so this political gap allowed these Imams to actually be more active, more overt in teaching their teachings or the teachings of Ahl Bayt salam. Yeah? And it reached its climax at the time of Imam Sadiq where we hear reports that what 4,000 people would be present at the circle of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Huh? Very powerful influence, very powerful influence. But of course, at that time, after the Abbasid government had become powerful, very established, now pressures started to occur to Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. There was a lot of pressure from Abu Jafar al-Mansur, for example, a lot of pressure. There are reports that say Abu Jafar al-Mansur would say something like, if it hadn't been that this person is my cousin, he would be very annoyed how many people are surrounding him and come to him. He would say, had he not been my cousin, I would have done this and this and that, you know. And there are some reports that talk even with a harsher tone than this. And there is a report, for example, let me, let me share it with you, that once Mansur wrote Imam Sadiq, why do you not visit us like people visit us? Because he wants um, legitimacy for his authority. And Imam Sadiq, alayhi salam, and there is a report that actually Mansur would say, uh, you know, I, by God, I will kill this man. He is doubting our authority, something like that. He's doubting our legitimacy. So he's saying, why do you not visit us like people visit us? Imam Sadiq answered, Laysa lana fid dunya ma We're not interested in anything in this world. We don't have anything in this world that we fear for because of you. 
or we fear from you for. Nor do you have anything in the afterlife that we would hope it in you. Nor are you in a blessing that we should congratulate you for, nor are you in a calamity that we should console you for. And he responded, he said, but okay, you know, accompany us so that you can give us counsel. Imam Sadiq wrote him, Man yatlubu dunya la yansahuk, wa man yatlubu al-akhira la yashabuk. Whoever is after dunya does not give you counsel. Whoever is after akhira does not keep your company. Later, Imam Sadiq was martyred. There are reports that say he was martyred by poison. Um, from Mansur, there are reports that say, you know, he died a natural death. The Shia narrative usually choose that. He actually was martyred. That's Imam Sadiq Now later, with Imam al kadhim he was, we know that he was imprisoned 15 years or so, or even more, placed in prison. Okay, why? We ask ourselves, why? Huh? Isn't it because these imams were actually doing a highly powerful and influential work rather than some narrative that some people claim that, you know, these imams were living by taqiyya. They were living by taqiyya. Some people think so. They were living in some corners, you know, in the darknesses, in the shadow. And they would not be clarifying the ma'arif of Ahlul Bayt, the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt. In fact, we see in history that at the time of Sadiq and Baqir and Kadhim and Rida, there was the peak of debates on theology, theological debates, Amr Bain al Amrain, you know, between predestination and delegation, which is our position. Very clear. Imams clarified also positions on Adil, justice, divine justice. What is divine justice? The Muslims were divided on this. Discussions on what? On Imama, for example, that defined also the school of Ahl al-Bayt alayhum as -salam, yeah? Discussions on Tawheed, what is God, the attributes of God. No, they were very active. Yes, if they have observed Taqiyya, it might be for not to get in direct clash with the authorities. You know, one might ask, like Imam al-Hussain alayhi salam, he went for Shahada, he attained martyrdom. Why did the other Imams not do so? Does Imam Zayn al-Abidin not want or like Shahada? Does the Imam Sadiq, Baqir, do not like or want Shahada? No, it's basically, it wasn't necessary. What Imam al Hussein has done was enough. Was enough for laying that foundation that later Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al-Baqir, Imam Kadhim and Rida, they started actually erecting that building and defining the features of that school. And it reached a stage where Imam al, uh, Imam al Kadhim, for example, will be placed in prison. Now, Ma'moon came to government and he thought, like, okay, look, this iron fist policy is not working. And it didn't work. Otherwise, why would Ma'moon suggest that Imam Rida in Medina should be brought to Khurasan to be the crown prince? Had it not been that, these people were very influential in their communities in a way that would, you know, raise the suspicion of the governments. Yeah? So this is just a, you know, a brief um, overview just to show that basically the Imam's missions were to teach the principles define the features of the school of Ahlul Bayt salam, which Imam Hussain laid the foundation for. And that was the principle. If there was any deviation from that principle, it would have been circumstantial. Only so that you don't get into clash with that, let's say, authority, because otherwise your goals would be jeopardized. Sometimes taqiyya could be because, you know, the public are not ready for understanding some things that you have. Not any truth that you know you go and tell it. And we see Imams actually saying something like this. Imam Sadiq, when he would say to his companions something like, you know, carrying our cause is not only accepting it, so this is in Kafi, but also to protect it from those who cannot bear it. Huh? That's a very important point. Because some people go to the narrations of Imam Sadiq that, you know, taqiyya, taqiyya, be careful, be careful, observe taqiyya, to think that when Imam Sadiq says, you know, taqiyya is my religion, the religion of my forefathers, that this means that we live by taqiyya forever. No, that taqiyya is basically something like this. You do not. You protect sometimes knowledge or truth that you know from people who can't bear it. Not everything that you know, you go and share it with people. You might create a barrier between you and the public, and therefore they would not accept anything from you. It's a very logical and smart move from any leader, actually. Imam also says to Mu'alla bin Khumais, Mu'alla bin Khunais, sorry, Ya Mu'alla, conceal our cause and don't announce it. Huh? What is it? So it's, it's a very important thing to actually go back to history and understand whom 
the imams were doing taqiyah from? That's a very important point to analyze and to study. Was it the authorities only? Huh? Or was it also the public? Or was it the scholars maybe at the time? Because imams' resources were very few, right? If, let's say, the prominent scholars or fuqaha at the time would, let's say, wage a war against the imam in the intellectual sense, right? The resources of the imam might be very weak to fight back, let's say, intellectually. Huh? So these things could be thought of in that sense. So when you are working in a cause that is generally in opposition to the authorities or the majority, huh, then secrecy becomes your way to go, becomes your tactic. And this is where we see imams actually recommending or commanding their companions, saying, for example, observe sabr and kitman. Observe patience, sabr, and kitman, secrecy, silence, quietness. Yeah? Sabr teaches you to what? To think, to think, to take your time and think before you act impulsively, maybe. To weigh out, to weigh options, to calculate. That's sabr. And Kitman allows you also to be able to have this margin of movement when you are someone who's carrying the truth and carrying thoughts of truth. Yeah? Very important um, attributes. Okay, so inshallah, I think I might be out of time. Let me take a couple of minutes just to mention the other extreme. When is taqiyya then impermissible? Yeah? Is taqiyya something that is unconditional? Should the ummah reach a stage where it becomes numb to dangers, for example? Let's say there's an invasion coming. Oh, no, no, no. I want to preserve my life, the life of my friends. I'll observe taqiyya. Huh? Does it reach that stage? Does it reach that, does it reach that level? What is the limit? So this is where Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, when he says, فَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ يَعْمَلُ الْمُؤْمِنُ بَيْنَهُمْ لِمَكَانِ التَّقِيَّةِ مِمَّا لَا يُؤَدِّي إِلَى الْفَسَادِ فِي الدِّينِ فَأَنَّهُ جَائِزُ yeah? You're allowed to do taqiyya as long as there's no corruption in religion. Then no, taqiyya is not allowed. You can't do taqiyya then in that sense. Or when we see the Imam, so in Kulayni, Kulayni in Kafi, he reports from Ja'far Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, Taqiyya has foundations, has conditions. If you don't observe these conditions, you're not permitted to do taqiyya. Huh? You're not licensed to do taqiyya. Or the other hadith, Shaykh al Tusi narrating from Abu Abdullah Sadiq, Inna taqiyya li yuhqana biha dam, fa balagat al taqiyya tu dam, Fala taqiyya, right? If you observe taqiyya, and that means that some bloodshed will happen, taqiyya is not permitted for you. Because the reason taqiyya is there is to preserve blood, is to save blood. But once, if you observe taqiyya, it means that someone else will die actually instead of you. No, you're not permitted. That's a limit. That's a limit. So let me stop here. I really appreciate your patience. Uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, that he may increase us. Uh, in knowledge and allow us to understand this uh, very very interesting topic actually um aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin salawat